Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Live Binders at Butte College, or as I call it, Live Binders application for collaborative learning. So um, before anything else, I want to make sure that uh, we know that this is a presentation. This presentation is being recorded uh, for uh, use in Flex for other times. Uh, my name is John Dahlgren. I will be um, presenting what I know about Live Binders today, and I'm uh, enthusiastic about it and would definitely like to um, share what I know and hopefully uh, encourage your use of Live Binders here at Butte College. And I'll start off with a question, and the question is, have you ever had content either inside your classroom or needing to share with somebody that wasn't readily available except by email or a copy? Yeah, I see a few of you out there that definitely have that circumstance. This is my favorite because when I was in junior high and high school, I was kind of a binder nerd. And so for me, setting up a binder was kind of usual and customary to what I did in school. Um, I enjoyed the feel of it. I enjoyed the contextual learning by putting my hands on it, connecting my eyeballs. Of course, I didn't learn that until much later in my now teaching life that I realized, oh, there's really a cognitive connection there. But circumstantially, it's labor and it's what I guess I'd call today analog content, that the content isn't in a digital form until or if I scan it or have access to the originals of that information. So what I'm really here to talk to you about today is my journey that talks to you and shares what I learned in seeking something that transformed this into a digital form that's usable. And I spent quite a bit of time in lots of different areas trying to resolve that. One of the most obvious was I went down the path of, let me just send you an email with links. Let me just tell you through the link what it is. But as a receiver of emails, what happens sometimes? We don't have access. What happens sometimes? We don't have authorization. What happens sometimes? The link isn't correct or it's broken. So in this case, that was not a really effective way of sharing. And as I started to use learning management systems, I realized in the area that I teach, I teach in drafting technology, uh, I really had a need to look at a lot more varieties of content as I go forward. So before I go any further, let me just tell you that what you're going to see today and what I'm presenting to you today is through a live binder. So I have lots of different content in this live binder to share with you in lots of different formats to share with you. But the premise of it is I do not have this on a thumb drive. I do not have this in any other form that I've downloaded and made available. All I have is a connection through the web. And so in that, I've just made my screen full size to give you the presence and concentration of this live binder. So for me, this is a little background on me. And this is the same background that I now use in my syllabus for every class. So the first thing that LiveBinders really helped me do was to consolidate that I don't have to keep making things over and over again and copying and sharing them to different courses inside Canvas. Now some of you probably have the circumstance of teaching multiple sections, in which case you can consolidate your sections into one master class and do that. I don't have that. In my program area, I teach one section of a course where I don't necessarily have easy linkages. And of course, Dave Stevens and Chris uh, Palmarini would probably say, well, there's ways to do that. And that's true. There are ways to do that. But in my case, what I really like about uh, what this is doing for me now is all my contact information is readily available. Uh, I have found over the last couple of years that I've moved offices quite often. So all I have to do is change my office location one time, and the rest will take care of itself because that's automatically then updated. I have my office hours listed, I have my phone numbers listed, my email address, and so on and so forth. Each of these links is live. So I can take the journey all the way outside of Live Finders right into LinkedIn. In this case, I'm not logged in to see or 
authorized to see. So uh, I encourage my students, I try and control that with my students so that they are using LinkedIn as well. Back to Live Binders. Again, my journey with this was to find something that afforded the opportunity to take what I had in hand form, paper form, napkin sketch form, and turn it into digital content. So in addition, I have a very busy calendar. I have a way now that I'm comfortable with sharing my calendar with anyone and everyone who needs to see what my world and what my day looks like. So in this case, I'm not going to teach you how to use Outlook. That's not my job. My job is to really share with you that the really cool part about this is now I've embedded my availability so that students see that on any given day, when am I available and how am I available. So I'll just come on over here and on the 28th of January, you can see what my day looks like. Pretty full day, but available. That's my want and my goal is to be able to share that information. I do a lot of connecting with people, uh, businesses, and contacts outside of Butte. Now I've actually started using this live binder available to everyone publicly as my contact point to share what I want to share, how I want to share with people outside the school so that I can have them look at my calendar and arrange a meeting that works for both. So there's an intersection here of uh, really kind of helping me with my own discipline of keeping myself up to date. In this case, I can also add static content about my teaching style, give you a little bit of background about me. This is the same content that I put up on the staff and uh, faculty area so that the link that goes to my BC through the scheduler is also here so that I have that same narrative being told in multiple spots. And this is just more static content, but this is actually content that comes to you through a PDF. So in this case, I don't have any need for anyone to have that content to edit. I can make this content shareable. And again, this really did start on the basis of what can I do to give my students more information in a way that's controllable by me and contextualized to what they're doing. And so as I continue to manage that going on, and you can see now the real interesting part of what I'm showing overall here is this is a binder inside of a binder. So now I can have a relationship of binders that are multiple binders on a shelf, multiple shelves in a binder, and I have a relationship that can be one to many or one to one or many to one. So back to the table of contents, which is automatically generated by the live binder. I can give you all access to this live binder. All you have to do is copy that QR code in your phone and you have access to my binder right away. All the embedded binders, all the content, everything I've shared with you today so that you can look at this. And I will say, if you decide to go back to this a year from now, you might find that some of the content has shifted because it's live and being updated, it's digital. So it, it follows me the way I want it to follow me. So again, my background from a business and, and engineering standpoint kind of led me down this path of I needed a way to have my content work inside the organization and I had to have a way for my content to be accessible outside the organization because I'm also a trainer. And so I use my content to help others outside the organization, either through classroom training with contract education at Butte or other consulting that I've done outside of the college, I have my content available to me. And I have that afforded to me, as Dave Stevens would remind us always, we own our content. So I have that benefit. So in a table of contents view, that's automatically generated. It's automatically available. Before I go any further, I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and click on the Live Binders introduction. And as you can see here, this is a PowerPoint. This is an embedded PowerPoint. And that's important because that's a learning discovery for myself. I've been a Dropbox, us Dropbox user for a long time. Unfortunately, Dropbox 
a couple of years ago was hacked and they tightened down their security making it very difficult for us to share Dropbox content even through Canvas. So I'm finding myself in that mode now where my content will probably migrate to OneDrive because that's where my students live. That's where I am. I'm also sensitive to the fact that many students prefer Google Drive. Both OneDrive and Google Drive have direct application access through LiveBinders and Canvas. So interoperability with the content was something I was looking for. So in this case, this is an embedded PowerPoint. Just to give you a sense of what that looks like. I didn't make a lot of slides for that. But here is the presentation overview. I'm going to control the size of the screen here. There we go. And as I said, information without knowledge is just information. Information with organization becomes knowledge. So my highlighted element here with the bold on is live binders is precisely what its name implies and that's absolutely true. It's a live electronic digital binder that has become really valuable to me in my pursuit of effective organization and curation because that's often what I find I'm doing now as a teacher and trainer is I'm curating content. So I want to make sure that that content is given to my students in an effective manner, my trainees in an effective manner so that it doesn't become just information that's really cool to accumulate in PDF file form, but just adds a lot of digital space that I can get just as cluttered in a digital realm as I can in my file cabinet in my office. So I can tab it, I can frame it, I can embed it. There are so many different things that I can do, and, and that was the premise of supporting uh, today. Let me give you LiveBinder's introduction. Do you remember the old days when you would organize training materials, class lessons, or client documents in a three-ring binder? Do you remember how professional and organized that felt? How do you package and share information today? Drop it in an email? Throw it in a box? Drive people crazy with files in multiple locations? How does that make you look? There's a better way, a live binder, where all your information and content is organized and easy to share with tabs and sub-tabs forget something at the last minute? No problem. Just add it in. Binders can easily be shared as a link. Content can be added quickly with a single click from anywhere on the internet. Just live binder it. Have multiple files you need to add? Simply add them all at once. Live Binders is a great way to look professional and show your audience that you care enough to neatly package and organize the information you're sharing. More at livebinders.com. So a couple of things I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on. I'm not here as a commercial for live binders. I'm a user, and that's a perspective I'm sharing with you, number one. Number two, uh, part of my pursuit of this was to create a realm in the digital world that was effective for students, as I've already said, and one of the most effective uh, concern, I should say, mo one of the most significant concerns from a student standpoint is how much does it cost? And let's face it, from a faculty and a staff standpoint, that's our same concern. This is free. Everyone can establish a free account through LiveBinders.com. That's how I started. Uh, the only limitation and difference really is that there are some other collaborative tools that become available if you buy a subscription, which can be as little as $50 a year. I do not use it as an alternative to Dropbox or OneDrive to be an infinite supply of my information as a uh, terabyte drive. That's not what I'm intending to use it for. As a matter of fact, with the free account, the true intention of LiveBinder is that very little content is actually local to your account. Only things that you really can't find other ways to share or embed from other sources is the reason why you would have content. So the limitation of a free account sounds incredibly low, but it's only 50 megabytes. That's okay. I actually haven't gone beyond about uh, a megabyte in my account. So in that case, very little content is shared and curated at LiveBinders because it's shared and curated from my own sources that I've made available through LiveBinders. And that's kind of an important element to characterize LiveBinders. So you got kind of an overall sense of it. This also kind of communicates an overall sense of how LiveBinder started. 
Uh, so uh, Tina Schneider and her uh, business partner uh, got together and with a Silicon Valley background, uh, they both realized that in a K-12 environment, uh, teachers were suffering from the same issues, that they have lots and lots of content, but not a lot of content available easily. Um, with the migration into the use of Google Classroom, uh, Classrooms now at the K-12 level, um, there were other ways that these tools could be uh, used. So with that, the, the invention, if you will, of live binders. Um, one of the other concerns and criteria that I had in looking for live binder or a binder content in the digital realm, I needed it to continue life. And that's an important point because some of the things that I find with free applications is they come and they go. And if they disappear on me, then it's no good to me. And I'm assured through uh, what I know and direct connection with the uh, owners of LiveBinders that the intention of this is that um, it is all managed through Amazon Web Services. It is all curated in their own digital realm and will continue life even if the partners decide to retire. So that's a pledge that they've made. I appreciate that pledge. Um, it takes a lot to uh, make an app and make it work. It takes a lot to keep an app and keep it working. All right, so um, this was just a four slide show through another live binder that gives you an idea that here's the content, I have it in one place. I have usually four to five sections of classes that I'm teaching per semester. And a lot of my content, especially when I start a class, is very much the same. So as I do that, I can get from very much the same because I've copied it from one class to another to exactly the same and that my message is effective. And in that case, if I have students in multiple classes, they're not hearing multiple narratives. I'm able to do it one time. Okay, so you, you can see here that just takes me out to YouTube, I don't really need that anymore, but I can also go ahead and move myself back up and my LiveBinders introduction is done. This QR code for the LiveBinder, I generated in LiveBinders. So if I had something I needed to process right away to a student or right away to a group of students, I can actually create that QR code and embed that during class. So in other words, I can make live changes and live edits right away. I also have the URL for each of those QR codes, or in fact, as you're looking at this content, anything and everything has a URL in content that can be shared directly. Some of the other things that I was needing to encompass in an approach to a digital binder is propriety. Sometimes I don't want to share everything. Sometimes I need this information to go only to one person or to a group of students or to a group of colleagues. In this case, I have the ability to share it. I can share it openly and publicly and I can list it so that all of the encoding and metadata is put out on the web and the web crawlers will take care of it and all of my content could be out there. Or I can share it without listing and make it copyable. I can share it with no copy. I cannot share it at all and keep it completely private to myself which I find is actually helpful because as I'm building and developing and I'm doing my own organization, if you will, taking the analog approach, putting the three-hole punch to some of my content and updating my binders, I'll privatize it until I'm ready to share it. So the other thing I can do is I can search within the tool itself. And one of the things I really like about that is I tell my students 60% of your success in any one of our classes relating to industry is vocabulary. So what am I saying? Learning the words, learning the context, learning from a, here is the abbreviation for that, here is the acronym for that. Every organization has acronyms and these are important tools that the students now can use. One of the other things I was looking to encompass on the student benefit side is when they're not our students anymore. Students have an objective of getting through the class. 
the long term, I found myself often having phone calls, email discussions, text messages from former students saying, hey, JD, can you share that project we did? Can you share that regulation that you made a copy of years ago? Can you show me where you found this? Now I have a way to share this information in a usable form, in a control my own narrative form so that it's appropriate and real from the student standpoint and used long after the class is over. And here's another benefit. If I share this binder and it's a collaborative share, meaning anyone can edit and copy, then I've now added the potential of former students giving me content back and aligning with what's really happening in the real world in our profession and the world of engineering and the world of drafting technology, these things are dynamic and they change. So if I have a chance to take that content and now not just in one direction, me to the student or me to the former student or me to the trainee, but I have a chance to work with a group of former students, I now have created a dynamic advisory environment where the information isn't just shared once a year, it's shared immediately. So as you can see, I'm, I'm logged in. This is just kind of giving you an idea of what, what would you see if you had an account. So I have binders. I have shelves. I have uploaded files. And I have a profile that's available that embeds image data and so on and so forth. I can delete and I can download a binder if I have an account. So I can take a binder and reduce it to a downloaded form and wherever the content exists, it would all be zipped up into one curated zip file. And that's kind of a, what I would call the use of live binders last resort, because quite honestly, it works much better if I'm using it live through the web. In the options area, just to show you the interface, I can encourage comments. In this case, this is brand new. But if I want to get feedback, hey, this link's broken. I want the feedback. It's very important for me to have the feedback. So comments are super significant to me. I can always go to the table of contents. I can download the binder, as I said. I can add this to a shelf on the fly. So if I have students who I will encourage to have their own account of live binders, now they can take the digital content from the class, and I'm still managing the content and they can have the binder on their own shelf, in essence, creating their own environment. And what I'm doing is promoting that good old, I was in high school, junior high school, three hole punch. How many of you have encountered this with millennials? Am I right? That millennials will come into the classroom with no preparation in hand at all. No pencil, no pen, no paper, nothing and expect to be using the digital tools that are available to them. The great part about Live Binders, there's an app for that, iOS, Android. It can be used on a phone. It can be used on a tablet. It can be used on a laptop, because all it requires is a web connection. So I can also, with characteristics that I can add in meta tags, if I want to share this out to the rest of the community of Live Binders, I can take other content that's far outside of my realm from another area of the country or the world and have that content in my binder. So an example of that might be if I want students to learn how to create an account at LinkedIn. And I find that there are, are three or four other LiveBinder users out there who have made really great content, might even be better than mine. What's my objective? Help the student get the account. I'm going to use their content because they've shared it and I already have their permission. It's open source. So I can also take the layout of this live binder and change it as I go along. And I, I'll show you a little bit about that later. If I don't like the tabs on the top, if I want and prefer to see the tabs on the right or to the left, in other words, if I really want to mimic the old analog binder where the spine would be along the left and the tabs would be along the right, I will show you some content that actually is embedded that way. 
So I'm going to roll back up here. And I'm just going to give you an idea of how I use live binders. And this literally is embedding binders in binders. You saw already uh, briefly that I use it for my syllabus. The thing I want to share with you about this right now is that my live binders tab called how JD uses live binders connects to directly sub tabs. So as you can see, I've made the top page or the connector of that uh, right here through the main tab. There's no content here. Forces my eye to look at what are the sub tabs that are there. So here's an example. Here's my syllabus. The table of contents for this class is auto-generated. My instructor information is exactly the same information that's up there from the presenter standpoint, no different. My resources and policies page is another binder because I teach multiple courses with one section each. I now have a common syllabus for all the content that I need, leaving me to only concern myself with the specific content and then link it as a binder. And I'll show you an example of that and how I use that in, inside Canvas. So these are static built, but they're dynamic in the sense that I could change this content on the fly by editing it and represent it. So we are all compelled to have a statement in our syllabus that says, this may need to be updated every now and again, and if it does, I'll represent it to you. Well, the old days with a paper syllabus, that meant redistribution of paper. We don't do that anymore. But now I got to make a new PDF. I got to email it, or I got to message it out, or I got to repost it. Or I may be using the Canvas syllabus, in which case I got to find all the places that I've got to update that. And with multiple courses and a single section each, sometimes I have to do that multiple times. Now I don't. So I can also link out to content through outside sources. So in this case, here is my Curricunet location for my public course outline. So in this case, my public location for my course outline is directly, and because it's curated on butte.edu through Curricunet, uh, it's accurate to the time as presented. So there's no shifting of time. This is represented as the legal form, when it was updated, who updated it, and so on and so forth. I kind of like that. That's a great way to share that. Now I have concentrated so far on my presentation being about sharing with students. I'd also like to tell you that this is a great opportunity to share and align content with your colleagues. So I have the circumstance and the pleasure of working with four different instructors in the drafting technology program who teach with me. And their teaching with me means that we all teach the same course. And in very rare occasions do we teach multiple sections. But because I may have an instructor assigned at an associate level teaching a course I'm not teaching, what's the first thing that I do when I bring, bo bring on board and onboard a new instructor? Again, Dave and Chris would say, don't do that, but I share my stuff. I take them right out to Canvas, and I have them copy it from my master class into a shell that they can then create and edit for themselves. The problem with that, as you can foresee, is that you get a time shift and a content shift. Now, some would argue, then you only need to worry about what the outcomes are. My bigger argument to that is, we want to control the outcomes to the best of what the student can do from a competence standpoint. And in my area, in CTE in particular, I have to be really concerned that we don't go too far out into the weeds with different projects. And this is a way for us to manage together. Because I keep all that content from my associate faculty editable. But what we're able to do now is standardize. Hey, I'm updating this. Great. It's an assignment rather than just a compulsion to do. Another great thing about live binders and I'm going to come back up here to the corner where my binders exist. And I'm just going to take you out to what I would see in my kind of, I, this is not something that anyone else would see. This is my portal into binders. You notice that 
I have content here, and this content is measured, or excuse me, is sorted by most recent. I can sort it and also view it in ways that make sense to me, given what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. I can do it by most recent. I can do it in alphabetical order. Most viewed categorically. I can sort it by comments and commentary. Least viewed, most useful, or newest. I'm going to say most recent again. And I also have the ability to use a big tile version of it so that, again, my bookshelf looks an awful lot like a shelf full of binders. So I get that presence of mind that kind of reminds me of my past, but I know that this is a lot more useful to me now. I also have on the left-hand side of the interface, I have my binders and my shelves. So I can take multiple binders and apply them to a shelf. Here's an example of Drafting 2, Engineering Graphics 1, and that has two binders on the shelf. And the advantage with two binders on the shelf is I have the Engineering Graphics 1 binder and I have the Planchard flashlight, which is their project. So in other words, now I'm sharing the content of the project and quite honestly, I'm using Canvas for what Canvas really should be used for. It's not a content manager as much as it becomes a learning management tool. So I still have all of the content that I would typically have in my work in Canvas, but in my course syllabus, as I'm showing here, this is a directly embedded Live Finder. If I click on that information, it takes me right back to the Live Finder. but I still have all of my assignments. What that has done, though, is it's reduced my file load inside Canvas. So now I have a chance to create, and this is a master course that I've created for Drafting 46 and for all of my classes, that if I'm going to share anything with my colleagues, this is what I'm going to share. But in terms of the information inside, the assignments are there, but there are no date restrictions to the assignments. Nothing is assigned until I get to the term because I take this content through Canvas and copy it to the course. So this is a shell that I keep as a master uh, for that. But the curating of content, the work that I actually do to build that content, I do through the Live Binder. Notice right now I've made that access private. And in this case, that access of being private means I'm not ready to release it to the students yet. And when I am, then I'll make it public and I'll make it shareable. But in this case, I can change that through my options. I can share it. I can embed it as a shelf. So my intention is to embed it directly as a shelf into the content area of Canvas. Any questions so far? <clears throat> if you have a shelf and you're sharing that with your students, can you hold certain binders within that shelf as private still? Yes. As you do, like with modules, you release them as you go along. Yes. You, the binders you can. You can. The only uh, thing I will tell you so far in my journey with live binders, I have not found a way to date bound or restrict to release. Yeah. Okay. So I, it's. Manual. It, exactly, it's a manual release. So um, it kind of forces me to be better about what am I time releasing. Yeah. Uh, so for example, I attended uh, uh, April Brown's um, Mastery Pathways or Mastery Path content development that she's using in CSCI 4, which I'm, I'm probably going to adopt for at least par part of my courses, that is very much into date-bound course release work or competency-bound release. So I have to be kind of careful that I've got those switches in the right direction to make sure my content's available with the student. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so back to how do I use Live Binders. I'm just going to come back up here to Binders. And as I go along, I'm, I'm kind of being painfully slow in, in how I show you this because I don't want to go too fast and give you whiplash. In my Clicking on the Live Binder, now I'm back to the place where I am for our presentation. I'm going to show you a couple other uses for Live Binders. So you saw the syllabus. 
Now I'm going to take you to something that I do through contract education. This is uh, something I call training. Now you notice it says training 6101. Now this is uh, content that I put together for Cal Plant One over in or uh, uh, excuse me in Willows, and the intention of that was to give them content that would help design employee descriptions around roles that are being served inside their manufacturing plant environment. So for the use of that in an overview page, you can see I've given a description, I've given my information about this content, and I've also given ownership to CalPlant. So in other words, I, I am not the owner of this content. CalPlant is, I'm just the agent of showing. So I can take you to CalPlant's website. This is their website live, embedded inside LiveBinders. So as their information changes, so does it change here. I have all of the information now curated in a job description in tabs and sub-tabs. And by the way, I said I was going to show you the tab change, the style change. Now these tabs operate more in a conventional web format to be on the left-hand side, forcing my eye to look to the right. So here's a sub-tab. Here are the electrician responsibilities. Here are the job requirements. And my point in sharing this with you goes back to 6101. So I'm going to come back to this live binder in an overview. I'm going to copy this link address, and then I'm going to go incognito for a minute. Now, we probably all know what that means now. What that means is that we're able to open up a window where I'm not logged into an account, and it's outside of any cookies that are being used. So control V. And you notice it takes me to, you don't have access to that. But because in the Live Binders content for this presentation, I gave you a code. It's 6101. So remember that, that when you open up that Live Binder without an account, it's restricted, but it's really easy to overcome that restriction with 6101 as the code and a verify. Now I'm back at CalPlant One. So that's a tool that I can use as a teacher or as a trainer or as an organizer to keep information proprietary. Example, you might be a member of a board of directors and you might have need for the minutes of your meetings to be in draft form ahead of a public release if it's a publicly uh, open and transparent committee or, or board of directors then the draft form might be restricted by a code access. Once it's finalized the way that everyone agrees and adopted, then the minutes are published and then open. And that is done with just changing how the binder is accessed. The other thing I wanted to show you with the static content is that I embedded a quiz from Google as a Google form. Because in Canvas, I have assignments and I have quizzes. And I have the ability to create content and quiz that content through multiple choice and other type questions. The problem is, is that if I'm working outside of Canvas, Canvas is no longer available to me. So with a Google tool, free to me, connected to my Google account, I can create a Google form create it as a quiz, have it be graded, and have the results of that quiz report out to whomever we give access to this. So CalPlan has access that when this quiz is given, then they get the results. Uh, the other thing that we've done is that we've created a, another area where this information goes out to uh, ONET, which is a online resource for job descriptions, but this is really to help their human resources department align with what is expected and usual and customary in the job description that they're creating so that they're not out of alignment. This has proved to be really useful for them. And again, it's there. Where was that link again? Here it is. So in other words, I now 
can make sure that it's done consistently. Hope that makes sense to everybody. Questions so far? Okay. All right. So I'm going to close this incognito window. And again, that was just to show that I've restricted that content with a, a passcode. It could be a word. It could be numbers. It can be anything. It could be one. It doesn't have to be anything special. Um, it is not a secure environment uh, code encoding unless you want it to be a strong password environment. It can just be a passcode. So here's another use uh, for me for live binders. And that's the use and the creation of project conformity to a standard. Big issue. Now you notice when you look at this binder embedded inside this presentation, the tabs are on the right. So now it mimics and feels an awful lot like the past and what it might look like in a content realm with tabs right in the content. Fine. I do love this. All the things that hang out outside the binder because I don't have time to put them in. Now I do. So here is just content that I have made a standard for, which by the way, comes from my experience in industry, and that's not saying that from a boastful standpoint, that's saying it from a conformity standpoint, that the expectation is that table of contents shows what's expected. And the, and the format of that, as I go down and scroll across here, tells you what revision and version it is. Versioning and revision is very important in the world of standards. And now I can go ahead and have the students link directly to the SME, uh, ASME standard. Or I can create other tools and other means for that. But as you can see here, I have that standard now embedded as a PDF document. The student can grab this link directly, or they can download through Adobe. And if I want to, because we are an Adobe site license user, I can restrict it through SharePoint if I want to. So in other words, if I only want a student to see it and not someone from the outside, hint here is that sometimes the regulations and the standards that we use, we paid for. So if we paid for them, we don't want to give a free standard to anyone out there in the realm. So I can restrict this content and not make it available to anyone other than a student who needs to use it but not own it. And I can even restrict it so that they can't download it. Um, right, wrong, or indifferent? Uh, this, one, this one broke, unfortunately. I was going to set up a Wikipedia embed. So the idea behind that is, is that I do have the ability to take, if you have a Wikipedia account, that's the key, you can embed, directly embed content from Wikipedia in, um, regardless of our prevailing opinion about how accurate Wikipedia is, it's still used an awful lot in industry. So here's um, other content that I'm working on right now. This happens to be content through a viewer through Autodesk. This is inside. I can log in. And because I have content at my Autodesk account online, uh, I can now use this content to share. Oh, look at that. 4 p.m. on January 17th. That's today, and that's right now. So bummer for me. If I could show you, uh, which I cannot, I actually have a model in here that students can manipulate. They have to have an account at Autodesk.com to connect with me. That's a digital connection through me, through Autodesk, the content that they're going to be building in AutoCAD directly through Live Finders. Now I have contextual learning. And so if you're trying to conceptualize with a student exactly how something looks, I can see applications for chemistry and physics or engineering where the student can now manipulate it with tools instead of just looking at it in a static way, they can actually look behind it, look inside of it, look underneath it. That's how we really want to see the digital realm work for us now. Okay, that's unfortunate. Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> 
But that happens and that's live and that's really cool. That's live information, not available to me. Uh, matter of fact, I, it appears by the clock. I just missed that by nowhere, but there it is. All right, so now let me take you to projects and how I am using projects that reside inside of a course and projects outside of a course. So this is, I created a flashlight project for my students. This is a, what we call the Planchard flashlight. Uh, with permission, I had uh, permission to use the, the project from a textbook. I got author permission to use it and curate that into. Uh, they thought what I was doing was great with live binders, so I feel very confident that, uh, that this is gonna be something that they may even uh, look at. More importantly, what that does is it allows me to embed procedures. And so I can tell students that there is a particular way I expect you to save this information. There is a particular way I expect you to transmit this information. And I can do this now procedurally, either through a PDF form or document. Because I can't tell you how many times, and it doesn't matter how many times I show that same document as a link inside my Canvas page, students don't see it. But if I put it up as a procedure to follow first, they'll follow it. They know this is the way to transmit it. And then my actual assemblies here, this was done with a, another curated page through Adobe. All of the information here to assemble these parts comes right here. And I've created on this side, I've actually created another table of contents so that the students can actually scroll through quickly and see this. And again, if the student wants to take this link directly, they can take it out of Live Binders and go direct to the link. And all the while, the really cool part is I'm still keeping some propriety to the ISBN number with permission. Uh, that that's readily available. So I wanted to show you some of the eight ways that I'm using Live Binders now in different and varied ways because as I find more and more I'm digging through my Dropbox legacy data, as I'm digging through so much of the information that I have, I'm finding that I'm, I'm able to become less of a digital hoarder, become less of a paper hoarder, and, and start to reduce that clutter in my life while maintaining a level of organization that is effective for me. The last thing I was hoping uh, that we could spend a few minutes on, uh, courtesy of uh, connecting with Susan Joachim and OER, is that we actually had uh, live binders come to the uh, tech conference um, in uh, Burlingame over the summer and make a presentation and do a breakout session uh, much in the similar manner here to show at a statewide level what we could do for the OER context. So this is an OER presentation. I didn't make this content. Actually, Tina Schneider made this content uh, directly from uh, her desk in San Francisco, and we shared it. So this was editable and available to me to edit. And again, I'm able to take this content directly and go right into what are the benefits? Taking control of the resources, transforming the resources into more usable, powerful digital data. So I've gotten this question a few times. I want to make sure that I address it because Microsoft has a, an application inside the Office environment called OneNote. It's cool. Matter of fact, I used it before I got to LiveBinders. What I found, though, is that if I'm going to dedicate myself to the world of OneDrive inside my institution's system, then anyone who tries to come in outside that system, I can't guarantee that they will always have access even if I give share permissions that says they do. In other words, there may still be authenticator information that's embedded in that from the institution standpoint, and I have to respect that. I have to abide by that. So, so part of what I'm saying is, is that using OneNote was great for me, but not effective for me outside the institutional world. So in other words, it limited me to using it with students or with colleagues, 
but because my world exists outside of it or with former students, I really wanted to make sure that I had a transparent device in this application that worked for me outside of the institution. And that's why the Y Live Binders for me become such a significant uh, uh, consideration. Um, Apple has a product, there's another app out there called Notes that's available out there. These are all very much the same kinds of digital curation tools, live links inside of the tool, kind of mini web pages inside of the tool. Uh, Microsoft has Verve, you know, with this kind of portal page that you can create for yourself. I get it. Google has the same thing. I get it. Uh, but for me, a third party in this case works better to marry and navigate the multiplicity of worlds that I get into with these different operating environments. So again, just once, once you've shared the context or the content, then they get it. It's, it's really available and available to them. Uh, I like this one because, you know, pretty much if you, uh, if you look at the, the link here, you know, we're preparing our binders for our staff handbooks. First we create all the documents, then we order lots and lots of binders. And after hours of printing, collating, printing stuff, we, uh, we need to order more binders. Julie comes to tell us at the last minute that there are sections that need to be added. That never happens, right? So again, you can see here this, con this uh, Live Binders Rescue is kind of a, a, a humorous way of, of helping to show the, the intention of uh, improvement. Again, if you've got it on a shelf, then you're more likely to remember where it is. You don't have to do or be a detective uh, on a multiplicity of occasions to try and help that. I really appreciate that LiveBinders went to the extent of sharing a study on productivity. I've actually used this in my classroom to talk about productivity because not coincident with the 60% I told you about earlier, but it happens to be about the same number, is to realize that in a 10 hour day, just to keep the math simple, how many hours a day do you think you're going to be using the application as a technical professional, engineer, drafter, Technician, you're going to really be there driving a mouse and using AutoCAD or using SolidWorks. And students love to tell me it's going to be eight hours a day at least. And the answer is about half of that. Because the other six hours a day is spent looking for stuff, sourcing stuff, finding information about stuff. And all of this now is part of the productivity problem that we've created. We talk at a high level with ideals that say the digital realm is going to improve productivity, but it's the old garbage in, garbage out that is truly the ruler here. And I find that uh, helping students and others really understand that the creation and the researching and gathering of information become the top two realms in this study, unbelievable. Now this was a study done in Western Europe, but it really is applicable globally. And as you can see here, looking for stuff shows up right there in number four. Any thoughts on that to share? Any, any validation? I concur. <laughs> as an engineer, I, I, I got to think you would, no doubt. Uh, so again, uh, looking at it through the context of the value of a study, um, that's available for you to take a look at. The other thing is LiveBinders is very open to, and this is how I found myself becoming a little bit more immersed in the live binders world uh, because I wanted, I, I guess in some former life I probably was from Missouri, I'm actually a California native, but I, I was from the show me state. It's like show me the benefit. I really want to see this. I was intrigued, but it seemed clunky. It seemed difficult and I didn't like that. I wanted something that was seamless, drag, drop, all that. Well, it is drag and drop and it is seamless and it is easy, but I, I utilized live binders to help me with that and that's something that in my old age I'm getting to a place where I'm more comfortable asking for help when I need it. So they're very open to scheduling a demo uh, for you to look at it beyond what I can do, or I'm happy to schedule a demo and show you more precisely, and then you have help at any time with Live Binders. Remember too that um, that's, that's the only commercial part. That was part of the breakout, not, not that's, the, uh, I should be, 
not stuttering on my words here. That discount applies all the time, not just during the breakout, that as educators, we do have the opportunity to get live binders at a reduced rate, if we need to. All right, that really concludes the presentation of why and what my journey with live binders is. And I think really kind of represents um, in my presenting my journey with you, the start point of hopefully a journey that you might like to take as well um, with live binders. I felt compelled to share this with you because it's an app that works. Uh, I think as colleagues, we, we should probably spend more time getting excited about sharing some of the stuff that we discover. Um, and my hope is, is that uh, collegially, this is something that um, we can share with our classified brothers and sisters. We can share with our management brothers and sisters here that in fact this applies across disciplines. So if you think about some of the committees that you serve on as faculty, here's the information, here's the 15 links that we just sent you and half of them are broken or don't have the appropriate permissions, you have to go through SharePoint to do that. Very frustrating, but if you find yourself in the constant loop of updating a procedure, here's a way to update it once and redistribute it in an effective manner. So with that, I'll uh, kind of turn it over to any questions you might have. Otherwise, thanks for coming.